Hello, and welcome to part two of Herbs for Winter Wellness, where I'll be sharing with you the types of soothing syrups you can use to help you when you feel sick over the winter, and particularly for if you get a cough. Hi, my name's Allison from The Well Cultivated Life. I'm an herbalist, an ecologist, an educator, and a lover of plants. And I love to share this herbal knowledge with you because I love herbs. So in the wintertime, we can get a lot of crunch coming along. And in part one of this series, I shared with you how you can use different types of herbs how the immune system works, how you can use herbs to support them so that when something does hit you, you are much better prepared to handle it. Now, stuff's going to happen, right? We are going to end up getting sick some of the time. And so one of the most important things that you need to do is to be prepared with the herbal preparations that you need so that when you're sick, you don't have to run off and find all the things you need to make something. And that's why I'm sharing this with you now, so you can be ready for the winter time. Using herbs is what we have done for thousands and thousands of years. It has supported us. And many of us have kind of forgotten how to do that. So that's why I want to share that with you today. Today, we're focusing, like I said, on coughs that come with a cold or a flu and what you can do to help with the different types of conditions that you might get in when you get a cough. So the first question is, well, why do we cough in the first place, right? What is the purpose of having a cough? And really that comes down to three kind of different areas. These are going to be obvious to you, but we, you know, we cough because we have things stuck in our lungs and we need to dislodge them, whether it be uh, something that's choking us or if it's just some irritating particles. A lot of times we cough when we're sick because we got these irritated mucous membranes and it, and it is giving us a little bit of relief towards an itchy throat. And the third reason is to help us remove a lot of mucus that might be stuck in our throat as well. And if you saw part one, we talked a lot about mucus and how important that is as part of our immune system. Now, these are really, really important functions for our body to be able to do. But what you find out is when you get a cough and you go to the drugstore to try to get something, what you'll see is a lot of times is these cough suppressants. So why are there cough suppressants when coughing is important? And I want to talk a little bit about today what we can do instead of taking a cough suppressant and also to help you just become aware of what exactly is happening when I'm taking some of these over-the-counter medications? Now, I'm not talking about any kinds of prescription drugs. Those are a very different situation. But when we get sick, and especially if we have a child that gets sick and they're starting to cough, we kind of go into a panic. And justifiably so, we need to be able to breathe coughing inhibits our airways. And so a lot of times what happens is we are not prepared, we go to the uh, drugstore and we buy something on the counter and we're rushing through and we're just grabbing what looks good. Because when's the last time that you stopped and actually read the entire like label on a box of something that, that you bought um, in the OTC section, right? We just don't have time, especially when somebody's already sick. So what I want to do today is just share some information with you about one particular um, drug, and there are many different ones that are in cough syrups, and just show you how does it work and why might you might want to be a little bit more aware about whether you want to take it or not. So this isn't I don't have anything against this particular chemical. It's just one that I found when I was doing some research and it's called dextromethorphan and it is a type of cough suppressant. And what it does, I thought was quite interesting. When we have a cough, we think, oh, I want something to help me either get rid of the stuff in there or soothe the irritation. But that's not what this drug does. It actually affects the signals from our nervous system that are going to the brain 
telling your body to cough. So the throat is like, oh, I got a cough. It, this is something's going on. But this drug disrupts that signal. And so the brain never gets it. And the brain does not send the signal back to the throat telling it to cough. So it's disrupting the cough reflex. And as you can see right here, this is a list of many different over-the-counter medications that contain this particular uh, chemical. And I got this off of drugs.com. It's a very good site that can give you a lot of information if you're curious about what's in my what's in my different things that I'm using, not just cough syrups, but all different kinds of chemicals. So, but the thing is, you know, that's not the only thing that we have to worry about when we're taking any type of drugs. We also have potential side effects. And so for something like this, which is an over-the-counter basic cough syrup, has all of this huge list of potential side effects. Blurred vision, confusion, drowsiness, shakiness, slowed breathing, nervousness, irritability, constipation, nausea. Now, none of these are life-threatening, right? But they certainly aren't some additional side effects I want. If I'm already feeling sick and I don't, and I'm trying to get better, I don't need all these other things happening to me as well. And then a lot of times we don't understand, oh, why am I feeling worse? And it may even just be due to those side effects. But that's not all. There's also lots of warnings that come with this particular chemical. It One of those warnings is do not give these to uh, children under the age of four. It can have life-threatening side effects. Don't use it if you have diabetes because it's very sugary. Don't use it if you have liver disease because these chemicals can accumulate in the liver. And don't use it if you have asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, anything that's already causing potentially difficult uh, breathing because we don't want to be suppressing a cough if something needs to come out. And then, of course, if you have any mucus or phlegm with your cough, which is like 50% or more of the time, then you also don't want to use it as well. And this information comes from the mayoclinic.org. Now, there are times when you might need this, and it's nothing against this particular um, drug, but I sharing this with you because I want you to be informed about what is actually happening when you are taking this uh, cough syrup, right? What, how it's actually affecting you and just to be aware of it because we want to be able to make choices. We want to be able to uh, be informed and we don't want to have to figure that out when somebody is sick. We want to know these things ahead of time. So that's a very good resource. And you might wonder, well, why are these things still on the market if it causes all these problems and cough suppressants aren't that good. Well, I'll tell you why. Money. The global cough syrup market is in the billions. And that's just cough syrup. It doesn't even include any of these other over-the-counter drugs or other prescriptions. So there's a lot of money to be made in uh, over-the-counter medications. And there isn't a lot of money to be made when you are just harvesting herbs from your yard. So let's get into a little bit more about the plants themselves, because I want you to take your health into your own hands. I want you to learn about these plants that have supported us for thousands of years, because many of these are already in your cupboard. A lot of the things that we can use are foods. And then at the end today, I want to share with you my step-by-step -step for how you make an herbal syrup. It's super easy to make and uh, you can do it just in an hour or two on your own stovetop with whatever you already have in your kitchen. But before I get started, I need to just talk about what this information is. And that's exactly what it is. It's educational information. These are traditional uses of plants. I use them. I can't tell you to use them unless you do your own research and if you have any kind of pre-existing conditions, if you're on any type of medication, any prescriptions, you really need to work with a qualified health professional to make sure that you're not having drug interactions. If you're pregnant or nursing, definitely need to be very cautious about any type of herbs that you use because herbs are a chemical just like the over-the-counter medications. And so they can react with a lot of uh, medications. And the other thing I just need to make sure that I say is that 
we're talking about breathing here. We're talking about our life. If a cough does not clear or move in some way quickly with herbs, you must seek additional help. So that said, let's get into the, uh, how do I actually pick what kind of herbs I might use? I'm a beginner. I don't know, Allison. Like, how am I supposed to get started doing something like this? So one of the approaches that you can take to looking at a cough is what's called herbal energetics. And this is looking at a couple of different aspects of kind of what's going on in the tissue that's being affected. So in this case, it's our mucous membranes and our maybe our whole respiratory system, maybe our lungs. What is going on there? And we can make an assessment is uh, by comparison to comparing two different uh, sides of a spectrum of conditions. So is the condition damp or is it dry? Like, am, am I having tons of phlegm and moisture and drippy nose, or am I very parched and irritated? And in that case, it would be more dry. And the next thing that we can look at is, is it hot or cold? And by hot and cold, I don't necessarily mean the actual temperature that, you know, in, in Celsius or Fahrenheit. What I mean by that is, is it more inflamed or is it more stagnant? And then the last thing we can look at is tension or relaxed. Is the area very tense? If we have a really irritating cough, we're going to have a lot of tension in our chest and even in our um, diaphragm and so on. If we're very relaxed, sometimes we're letting out almost too much liquids and the we can get dehydrated in that case as well. So let's start by talking about wet coughs. This is a cough where that's, there's a lot of phlegm, there's a lot of liquid coming out, there's a lot of mucus being made, and in this case, we can use herbs that are drying to help alleviate some of the stagnation that might happen. We want that we don't want a lot of phlegm pooling up inside our system, and what helps with that is if we take warming herbs to thin down the mucus, and that makes it a lot easier for the mucus to move out of our system. Because if you saw in part one. We want mucus, but we want it to do its job and it needs to be of good quality. So today I am want to share a list of herbs with you, but I also brought some herbs from my own garden or my kitchen. And this first one is fennel. And I grow a fennel in my yard called bronze fennel. And even though it's not the same as this one here in the, um, that's the commercially available fennel that you often would buy in an herb store or you would see in a kitchen. It's used a lot in, in Indian cooking. Uh, this goes in my yard and so I'm going to use it. Bronze fennel. So it's easy. It recedes itself. And fennel is a great plant for all types of people. It's very gentle. It's a mild expectorant and it's also antispasmodic. So that helps to calm down some of these um, can help to calm down some coughing. It's also used in the digestive system a lot as well. And it's warming and drying. So if this would be a good thing for a wet cough. And we usually make this into a syrup, of course, or into a tea. The next plant is angelica. And this is a cousin of fennel. They're all related. The fennel, uh, th I have an angelica in my yard right now. And normally... I would harvest the root from this, but I'm trying to get Angelica. I had it a years ago and it kind of died out. I'm trying to get it to reestablish itself. So I didn't want to harvest the root because I want this to go to seed next year and I want it to reseed in my garden. So this is the leaf of it. And it has a very sort of liquor, mild licorice type of a taste. And you can eat the, you can eat the um, stems and the seeds, but for medicinal use, we are using the root of the angelica and it's also, there's a different varieties of it and any of them can be used. It's antispasmodic, it's, it's an expectorant and it's warming. So it's good for a wet cough. And then you can make it into a syrup, a decoction, or you can actually make an alcohol extract out of that as well. The next one is one that everyone is familiar with, ginger. It's a food that is easily accessible from 
all the pretty much every grocery store in this day and age. And many grocery stores will also have organic versions of uh, ginger. And I like to buy everything organic if I can, because I'm trying to make medicine out of this. And so I don't want to bring these other chemicals in if I can help it. Now, luckily, a couple of um, well, the sun's coming in the window, um, a couple of a week or two ago, I was at a farm and they had just harvested some ginger. And where I live, we don't get the brown, we don't have a long enough growing season for it to get that brown skin and be able to be storable. So I'm going to use this to make an herbal syrup. And as you'll see at the end, I can just store that in the freezer until I might need it this winter. So you can get ginger grown locally that is awesome if you can if you have access to that now if you only have access to some powdered ginger and you feel like you need it based on some of these conditions here then by all means just use some powdered ginger the next thing that you can get another food that's easy to get in the grocery store is orange and in this case we're using the orange peel it's warming and it's especially for helping with excess mucus so we can throw, I throw orange peel into pretty much all of my um, winter syrups that I make because not only does it help with these properties, but it also tastes really, really good as does the ginger, as does the fennel. And you can make an extract out of it, but a lot of times it's just more delicious even just in a tea. Now I had to bring garlic in. We talked about garlic in part one of this um, of this series because it is a great support for the immune system in general, but it also has these anti-inflammatory and anti-spasmodic effects. It's warming and somewhat drying. So this is a place where it could work well for a wet cough. Now, I don't know if I'd be throwing garlic in with all of my other, uh, with all of my other delicious orange peel and fennel and those things. But I do always grow garlic every year. And I also take garlic anytime I start to feel kind of cruddy. Immediately, I'm uh, chopping up some garlic. Maybe I'll eat it raw. Maybe I'll throw it into a broth and eat it that way. And the next one that we have, which is sort of the big uh, cough remedy used a lot more in Europe is elecampane. In this plant, we use the root. It is the go-to herb if you have starting to get it's sort of more of like an infected type of situation. You know how you your mucus normally is clear. Sometimes it gets kind of thick and white. And then when it starts to get yellow or green, then you start to realize, oh, something's going on here. This is not a normal situation. And it may have a, an infection starting up. And so elecampane is what you would go to at that time. You can make it into a syrup or a decoction. Uh, a lot of roots have a very bitter taste to them. And I always keep an elecampane extract around so that I can add it to my syrups or two just to water in the case that I get into a situation like this. So that is our series of uh, plants that you can use for a wet cough. But what about a dry cough? In this case, we're going to want to moisten your uh, mucous membranes so that you can more easily cough and you can be more productive. And so the... Um, Dry cough is very irritating. It's unproductive. And there's a lot of tension, like I said earlier. So we use these moistening herbs, demulcent herbs, which basically means they're kind of slippery and gooey almost, like slippery elm. I don't usually recommend slippery elm, not because it doesn't work, but because it is an endangered plant. And so I'll show you a couple other plants you can use instead. If you have stuck phlegm, you can add an expectorant. And or an anti catar, which basically just means it helps to reduce the, the mucus. And then you can even bring in a type of like nervine sedative plants, which are going to help to relax and calm the spasmatic cough that you sometimes get with a dry cough, especially an unproductive. It's like your body's like trying to get this stuff out and it's not happening. And, and so it just tends to, to not relax. So 
if you saw part one, Mullen was listed there because Mullen is this great mucus regulator and helps us with our mucus quality, but it's also a demulcent. And one of the things, it's true for the elecampane as well, and for this Mullen, if you look here at the leaf, you can see that the shape of the leaf is somewhat like a, a shape of a lung. And so a lot, before we had all these chemical analyses, people would take a look at the what's called the doctrine of signatures and how plants look to indicate to them what the plant might be used for. And so for thousands of years, this is how we uh, connected with plants to find out what their properties might be. So uh, lung-shaped leaf, a lot of times with white hairs underneath, that's what you have an L campaign in this as well. So it's a demulcent and expectorant, and we can put it into a syrup, a tea, or you can actually make an alcohol extract out of that as well. Another plant is wild cherry. Where I live, it's black cherry. And I wanted to share that with you because I actually have a cherry tree growing too close to my house. And I'm going to have to cut it down. So I thought, well, I'm going to harvest the cherry bark then. And so the bark is the part that we use of the wild cherry. I mean, I harvest the berries too, because they're so good. And I just make that into a cordial. And, uh, but if you think about cough syrups, like commercial cough syrups, so many of them are cherry flavored, right? And so this comes from the wild cherry, which was used in a cough syrup. And you basically just use like a vegetable peeler to peel off the bark. You want the inner bark, but it's just trying to separate the two is very difficult. So usually I just collect the full bark and I'm going to have a lot of black cherry bark because this tree is pretty big, but the black cherry bark is uh, what's called anti-tussive, which means it does do some suppressing of the cough, but it does it more because it's relaxing those tissues in the throat. And it's also an expectorant as well. And we make this into a syrup or like I said, a cordial. And I usually make use the bark, but then I also will add some of the uh, black cherries themselves to get that delicious flavor. Now, the next couple of things are, again, these demulcents that can help us soothe and nourish our mucous membranes that can get irritated during a unproductive dry cough. And marshmallow, if you look at my channel logo, you'll see there's a marshmallow flower there. This is definitely one of my personal herbal allies. And you can harvest when you the tops or you can harvest the root. Now the root is more commonly used, although some people say that the root is used more for the intestinal tract and the lower half of our body, whereas the above ground parts, the leaf and the flowers are used more for the upper half of our body. And we can see here that the leaf itself does have some expectorant properties. Now, because it's so mucilaginous, one of the best ways to prepare this is with a cold infusion, meaning you basically put it in a jar with some water stick it in the fridge and let it sit there for 24 to 48 hours and then sip it that way. And this is how we usually use it if we're trying to do some help with some digestive issues. But let's face it, if you need to make a cough syrup and you need to make it now, we're not going to wait for a cold infusion if you come to the conclusion, this is the plant that I want to use right now. And another relaxing herb is valerian. Now, usually we think of valerian as for sleeping, um, but it is a type of sedative. It's antispasmodic and it's relaxing. And so we can add a little bit of valerian to the cough syrups that we're making. And what I like to do is I'll make this into an extract and then I'll just add some valerian in as a, an alcohol extract. Because let's face it, if you've ever tried valerian, it is nasty tasting. It tastes like dirt and dirty socks combined. And I was I was reviewing some information about valerian for the show, and I came across a quote from Rosemary Gladstar, and she's like, you know what? You really can't cover up the flavor of valerian, so just learn to appreciate its odd flavor for what it is. And that's true. 
that's true. There's only so much you can do about valerian, but it is very effective. It does um, cause some people to get overstimulated. And I read a very interesting thing that because it's so relaxing, people who might have some more intense trauma where staying tense is feels safe to them, that uh, sometimes it can stimulate a more awake type of a reaction in them. And I thought that was a really cool. That was from Warts and Cunning. She had a really uh, awesome information about that. It was very insightful how that might work. And so our last um, plant that we're talking about today is Colt's Foot, which is a classic cough and cold remedy. It comes out early, early in the spring with these yellow flowers. It's kind of unusual because it blooms first and then the leaves come out. So it blooms super early in the spring. So it got dibs on all of the early pollinators before anybody else comes out. It's kind of like a spring ephemeral. So a lot of these spring blooming plants will bloom so early before the leaves come out on the tree. They live in the woodlands, but they come out and bloom before uh, they get the shade from the leafing out canopy. But this is another plant that again has this big leaf with the white underside indicating that it might be for uh, use for the lungs. And this is an expectorant. It's also an antitussive, which means it calms down coughing. And it has a little bit of antibacterial properties to it and is used commonly for deep-seated phlegm. More, uh, maybe not such an acute situation, but something that's been going on for a while that needs to, that hasn't moved. So we make this into a syrup or a tea. It does have some properties in it that you don't, uh, some chemicals in it that you don't really want. They're extracted in alcohol. So you want to make sure you're just using a tea. You would not make an extract out of this. So those are the plants that I wanted to share with you, but I don't want you to leave yet because I want to go through the steps for making a supportive herbal syrup. It's a lot easier than you think. Now, you still have to pick out what herbs you want, but you can just start with some of the food herbs, like the ginger or the orange peel. And those are super simple and go through and make those. And then you'll have not only a helpful syrup, but also delicious syrup as well. But let me take you through the steps on how to make an herbal syrup. And it starts with making a decoction. And herbalists like to have all kinds of fancy words, just like any type of um, you know specialty. And so we're used to making a tea, which is technically called an infusion. And this is where we are pouring boiling water over plants and letting them sit and steep, usually until almost they cool down. And a decoction is used for types of plants which have, uh, that are harder to break down, seeds, bark, and roots. And what a decoction is, is that you're basically just simmering the herbs in water on the stove for an extended period of time, rather than just pouring the boiling water over them. So we make a decoction, we strain it out, we add honey, boom, syrup. Okay, so let me just take you through the more detailed steps on that. Now, when I'm going through and choosing herbs, I like to lay them all out on a plate like this because I want to see what the proportions are. This particular uh, blend that it, the picture on here is a blend that I was making for my husband when he was having some acid reflux. So it's got a combination of seeds. It's got the orange peel. That's kind of like a, a bark. I would put that in the decoction. It's got some licorice root in it. And, uh, but this is, this is not a cough syrup, but this is the picture I had available. It does have marshmallow root, which you might put into your cough syrup as well. Now you're going to choose your herbs, lay them out. And you want to get about one cup of total plant material, but separate the seeds, bark, and roots from the leaves and flowers that you might be using, because you're going to cook the first group First, so you're going to put about three cups of water in a saucepan and add that first group, root seeds and bark. Simmer that for one to two hours until you can see that 
they're starting to get kind of soft and mushy because we want to make sure that all of the properties we want have been released from the plant material. And that usually takes, you can go as low as maybe 45 minutes, but if you have the time, go ahead and do it for one to two hours. Make sure you leave a lid on it so none of the goodies escape. And always be checking it. Make sure you don't want it to boil dry, right? You want to be able to reduce the volume by about 50% so that we end up with maybe about a cup and a half of syrup, which doesn't sound like very much, but when you're taking it by the teaspoonful, it's actually a lot. So the next steps after you are finished simmering, you can take it off the heat, it's still hot, but now you're gonna add your leaf and flower herbs and you're just gonna, now it's like steeping them, right? So you add those in, let those steep for about another hour with the lid on, or if you're in a hurry, just make sure that it steeps long enough for it to get down below 120 degrees. And the reason why I'm choosing this temperature is because a friend of mine who's a beekeeper said that if you're using honey for your sweetener, you want to make sure that you're cool below 120 because anything above that can denature some of the positive healing properties of the honey. So you want to make sure you're cooled down. It's better to let it cool down more. You can always warm it back up again if the honey won't dissolve. But after it cools down, you're going to strain the herbs, make sure and compost them, and then figure out how much liquid you have left. And it's about a four to one uh, ratio between the liquid and the honey. Now, some recipes will tell you it's a one to one ratio, a cup of decoction to a cup of sweetener. And I find that to be just incredibly sweet. I don't like it like that. Some people more like a two to one. So one cup of decoction to a half a cup of honey. But I suggest that you start with a quarter cup for every one cup of decoction. And then you can always add more. But if you make it too sweet, it's going to, you're not going to want to take it. So once you make this, you just store it in the refrigerator. If you do not use this within a week or two or three, then go ahead and put the rest of it into the freezer. Another option is you can add an alcoholic tincture that would um, preserve it so you could keep it in the fridge for longer. But I generally just throw it in the freezer and then that way I don't have to worry about it. And when I need a cough syrup, my tendency is to go to my freezer because I'm used to knowing that there's some there. And you know how the fridge is like you put stuff in there and it like gets shoved all the way to the back. Um, recently, I made a delicious syrup uh, with elderberry, ginger, rose hips, black cherry bark, and thyme. Now I use the ginger stems. So it was very mild on the ginger because um, I had bought the whole plant. And the thyme has antimicrobial properties. And the black cherry, the rose hips, of course, have the vitamin C in there. And elderberry is, has an antiviral property. So this was mostly full and I brought it home or I, I put it in the fridge and it turned out that the next day my husband was having some crud and he needed some syrup. So he, it was available for him. I didn't have to rush around and find the ingredients and um, get it ready for him. So this is why it's a good idea to learn these things now, prepare some syrups, stick them in your freezer or your fridge so that you are ready in case somebody gets sick and is in need. So I hope this was super helpful for you. Thank you so much for watching today. Stay, Go back and watch part one if you missed that. Stay tuned for part three coming up where I'll be talking about what we can do, the herbs that are best for when we get a fever. Fever, like a cough, is another very important bodily um, function that we need. So remember, always do your research, be aware of drug interactions and pre-existing conditions, check with a health professional if you're not sure what to do. Thank you so much for watching. Follow me on social at Cultivate My Life. Subscribe to my channel, like this video, all those good things so that you can get access to more herbal and homesteading wisdom. Thanks again, everyone, for joining me. Take care. Bye-bye.